solutions. It can solve all problems. You just employ the technology and all problems will be solved. That does not happen. Also, we must realize that technology can be misused to deny property rights rather than recognize property rights. And our effort has been the way the technological solutions which we have evolved is basically an in response to the misuse of technology by the state government that we evolved our methodology and how we were able to fight it. So that is the story we would be talking about. So we would be talking about two examples. One is the uh, use of satellite images by Gujarat government through an institute which is a very well known and very recognized institute of geospatial technologies, BISEC and how we and the villagers use this technology. Context is Forest Rights Act. Most of, uh, most of the people here may not realize this, but in 2006, Parliament of India passed a, passed a law, legislation, recognizing rights of the forest dwellers, tribals living in forest areas, <laughs> cultivating forest lands, to get their light, get titles over the lands which they have been occupying. That was a revolutionary act. We had never dreamed in our imagination that one day we would see a day when this uh, uh, such a law really becomes a reality, but it happened. Also, it gives rights not only for the individual families over the lands which they are cultivating or which they are occupying for habitation, it also gives right to the village communities over the forest resources of their villages. So they can manage, including the right to manage forests for sustainable use. So these two rights were given. It also recognizes Gram Sabhas or village assemblies or village committees as a primary entity or primary authority to carry out this process of recognizing rights, receiving claims and verifying claims. So in a way, this was a revolutionary act. Nobody had many, and it did not come on its own. There was a long sustained campaign of many groups. We were also part of that campaign. And after three or four years of long campaign, we could see a day when this act became a reality in December 2006. And, and it became implemented. It start, its implementation started in 2008. So that happened. Also, I must say that this act was passed, a major battle was won, but there were strong vested interests which were not willing to get this act properly implemented. And one of the main vested interests was the forest department, which would lose all its control and authority over the forest lands and forest resources. So they were going to create stumbling blocks all over, all over for the proper implementation of this act. And our whole struggle from 2008 till now is an ongoing struggle to get this act properly implemented. To talk about this, this raid, India, in Gujarat, all these green areas are forest areas, and this, all these lands, 70 million hectares of land is controlled by one department, which is called Forest and Environment Department of the state. And in Gujarat, it is all these forest areas in the eastern hilly belt, we are working here in Narmada, one district, about 40 villages there, but we have a broad coalition with groups working in all the districts. So we are basically, through our work, uh, influencing outcomes in all these districts of Gujarat. 2008, it started, this act started implementation, uh, being implemented. In initial days, months, there was a big euphoria State government also said that it wanted to implement act in a proper way. It organized Gram Sabhas on a large scale, allowed the villagers to form their own committees for the implementation of this act. 182,000 families filed claims for the lands which they were cultivating. 1,000 Gram Sabhas filed claims for community forest rights over the forest resources to manage their rights. And, and Gram Sabhas verified those claims, carried out the processes, all these things were not easy, but they were so keen to get these things implemented. So they got themselves trained, everything, and they submitted 
their findings to the district authorities in around 2009, in the early months of 2009, these were delivered. And we were hoping that very soon we would get the claims, or we would get the titles, and everything would be fine. But that did not happen. In April 2009 itself, when Gram Sabhas were just submitting their files, the Chief Secretary of Gujarat declared that only 10% claims are genuine. The rest of the, all of them are bogus. This was the time when the author... Oh, thank you. So authorities had, been, had not even examined the claims, and yet they made this decision. So, uh, and as it followed, they uh, very, uh, one second. Oh. Hmm. And I'm running out of time. One second. Huh? How to go back? Hmm? Side one. Hmm. Let us forget about this. <clears throat> uh, we don't have time to go through it. But main thing that what government did, they said initially they uh, approved only ten percent of the claims. There were protests. We filed all. Uh, we made. We made representations, and government said that we would use satellite images to process the remaining claims. And we won't reject claims outright. We would use satellite images. So BISEC came into picture. It acquired satellite images, and then produced boundaries sitting in the office, marked areas that we, which are the areas being cultivated in these. Uh, um, forest areas and prepared maps which were and on the basis of it then it said that the district authorities must decide all claims based on these maps. These maps were there, earlier maps which I showed, but that's we I cannot go back. Okay. So on the basis of the use of satellite images, maps generated by the satellite images uh, they rejected, outright rejected, 1,10,000 claims, which was total misuse of the uh, whole property, uh, whole uh, technology. And because we were, because we anticipated that these, these are the things that would be happening, we started our generating our own maps. Tribals got themselves, and we also learned the GPS technology, which we never learned. We learned that technology, started mapping the lands, generating maps, putting them on satellite images, and we found that most of the land's claims should have been approved as a result of satellite images instead of being rejected. And so we filed a public interest litigation in Gujarat High Court. We challenged the rejections made by the state government, and we got a very good High Court order from High Court directing the state government to review all the claims that were rejected earlier. So all the claims had to be reviewed. They had to carry out the whole process. The process we suggested was approved by the state government, or by the High Court, and all other evidences were also approved by the High Court. As a result of this, this thing is started. All the review process has begun. And the result is that now we have helped about 83,000 families. Earlier, government had approved about 36,000 families. So now, 83,000 families have got their titles. And this is not all. So the approval rate jumped from 20% to 40%. That is only part of the story. Because even now, they are not using the maps and processes which we have generated properly enough. Only recently, the state government has started really using the maps which we have generated. They have appointed an agency to counter check the results which we have made. And as a result, they have examined these claims for 5,000 villages. And the results are that about 97% of the claims are getting approved. So we expect the approval rate to jump further in the coming days. And that's 
one thing part of the story. So my only lesson, my thing is the technology is important, but it is not everything. You have to do work on many other things to get it and get a proper use of it. The only good advantage is that even misuse of technology is we can counter that misuse of technology by using the same technology. And that is how we, uh, began, we, go, we have made some progress and we hope to make further progress in coming days. And I'm very sorry for the mess up with this technology. And being an engineer myself, I was really fascinated by, and when I actually, so I know Ambresh and Arch for more than 20 years, but as a practical demonstration of something that I used to only preach, that was my first exposure, and as a technologist like Ambresh said, we should be extremely careful about proposing technology as panache. We have now Bala, who has a technology and which is going to be proposed as a panache, so let's listen to Bala. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. The advantage of following uh, a fantastic speech and presentation like Ambrish's is one can get away with saying anything in the next 15 minutes while the audience is still in awe, right? <laughs> and since both Barun and Ambrish have stressed so much about how technology can be misused, I thought I would uh, present a technology that would allow for good use and as finally Ambrish ended this presentation, it would also allow one to correct any, anything wrong that, you know, that could, could happen, right? Um, my presentation is on how to use blockchain technology for maintaining land records. Um, I started uh, the presentation, when I made the presentation, it was going to look at the legal and policy aspects and the implementation, but Barun told me just now that I should also uh, explain the technology because some people might not have uh, enough information on that. So I'm gonna, I, 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 I pulled this out from uh, YouTube, so probably in 90 seconds I wanna explain because most of you know. I don't know how many of you have lost uh, some fortune on bitcoins in the last one month. Uh, if, if you're there in your Q&A, please don't ask me about that because this is, this is the technology that underlines, you know, uh, underlies uh, uh, bitcoin but not, um, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't in any way explain uh, the stock market. So essentially blockchain is uh, a platform on which you can add information, right? Linda was telling me just a few minutes ago, so I'm trying to like simplify it. It's a ledger, it's an accounts book. You keep adding new pages every day. And if you want to change anything written on any page, you have to add a new page saying, I'm making changes to this page. And this notebook, this ledger, is you know, available to be made into millions of copies. You want a copy of the notebook? You, you have one in your computer, you can put on your cloud, you can put on your server, you keep it with yourself. And when you think, you know, I don't want this uh, notebook anymore, you can get out of it and come back again and join you know, whenever you want. It essentially is simply a record keeping where you're not allowed to fudge the record because it doesn't allow you to. You can't go back and erase or overwrite. You have to add new information to explain this has been done. This means it does for us three things. Any information put on this record becomes irreplicable, immutable, and verifiable. These three words are going to be the cornerstone of why this technology is good for governance. I'm, I'm today presenting on property rights, but um, I have uh, uh, um, 
placed a bet with one of my co-authors. He is teaching at Harvard. I said, in the next 10 years, if blockchain doesn't become the go-to for all governance, uh, you know, improvements, I would give him $10,000. That's how much I believe this is going to happen. The UK government has already set aside some amount of money to explore this. Indian government in this budget has set aside money. Two states in India have already piloted proof of concept. And the state of Andhra Pradesh has come up with a technology, FinTech Valley in Vaisak, where they have an institute on blockchain in partnership with the Singapore University. Um, the most successful experiment of using blockchain for property rights, uh, property records, is uh, in Switzerland, uh, sorry, uh, Sweden, uh, with Chromaway. Uh, uh, Georgia is experimenting. And so I think this is going to be the future because of these three words. Irreplicable. You cannot create new records and say, hey, this did not exist, so this is the new one. Which means once your title is registered on a blockchain ledger, you cannot be denied that. You cannot say, oh, it's missing now. You cannot be said, oh, you never had it in the first place. Which is something that happens all the time. And two, you cannot change any fact and say, oh, it never was US fully. I was a party to it, for example, right? That's not possible. And most importantly, verifiable. This brings us you know, to the application across several domains. So not just having the records, but also making it easy for transactions in property. You want to go mortgage, you want to sell, then there are several parties involved. There's a financial involved, there's a real estate agent involved, there are advocates and lawyers of the you know, uh, um, uh, parties involved. All of them need to access this information, access these records, and verify whether they are right. And at the same time, is it possible that they are able to verify this without coming to know of any personal information before they strike a deal? It's absolutely possible, right? It simply is, you know, it, it's like creating new tokens, new, new fingerprints for each property record. So you send a hash, which essentially means like an encryption, right? So since all records on, uh, on, 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 the, on the computer system is in binaries, any record can be converted into ones and zeros, and then you come up with a formula. You say all ones multiply into seven, all zeros you know, don't take into account, and then square it, and then if they're the, the last digit you take and divide it, whatever the result is, the signature. So you only send the file that runs this and says, hey, this particular document holds true for this calculation. That's the simplest form of verification, and you can do this with any number of parties, right? So. Uh, if you have been following Bitcoin, you would know that it takes a lot of hardware power because you know it's it's because of the vast number of people you know uh, involved in that. But this is more like a personal, um, uh, say, blockchain ledger uh, because only those parties who are involved in a particular property are going to be dealing with it, and therefore it doesn't even cost a lot actually. Um, so now I go to um, the presentation itself. Um, so this is the egg, you know, why do we need uh, blockchain? I explained to you the technology aspect of it. What is the, uh, uh, what is the impact of those you know, technological advantages? Current land records management systems are outdated. Often, you know, in any country, simply because you have to have legacy and you have to have historical records, what it means is land records are often centuries old, if not decades old, and you're continuing to keep maintain the record the same way. You're writing papers, probably in cursive, right? In India, for example, in several you know, parts of North India, the old records are in Urdu, a language you know, not many people even you know, know now, right? So they're outdated and handicapped with processes lacking in transparency and efficiency. Meaning, you know, if I want to buy a, a, or, or, or register a piece of property, I go check records and then I ask my lawyer to check the same number of you know, records and then 
uh, the person who's say funding it would give some money and I strike a deal with that person say you put 10% now later on you give me 70% and then you give me 20% there are several stages at each stage there is a possibility for fudging the records now how do you ensure that doesn't happen it's highly inefficient and it has lots of opportunities for you know going wrong but since as I explained on blockchain all of this can happen concurrently we have some advantages it's secure and real-time you can you can do this on an app you can do this in the computer and be ensured that you know nothing is going wrong increase public trust I think that's most important um, uh, I have few copies of a uh, handbook that we came out in our uh, support from Arch and uh, FNF here on um, uh, a, role, a roadmap for uh, uh, deploying uh, blockchain for property rights in India that's actually applicable to all the countries. And there, if you see, we have you know, uh, explained how public trust is such an important thing because it comes from good governance. And the three cornerstone principles of good governance are there should be ethics, um, and then there should be fairness, and then there should be efficiency. If you have these three things in any governance initiative, there's public trust. And without public trust, everything becomes more expensive. So if you want to make a, a transaction property, and you, you're having to have the records checked six times, then you're going to pay for the record checking six times. You know, a battery of lawyers needed to go through the records and you know check um, and the banks have to go in to do the same thing the insurance companies have to do the same thing and all of those costs actually come to the consumer right and then it allows for creating and acting verifying storing and securing digital contact basically I explain what we call you know smart contracts uh, so now that we know this is these are the advantages what is, is it easy to transition? No, it's not going to be like any uh, new path-breaking technology. It's going to have some hiccups, but this is organic. This, this, is, this is like common law. It comes from you know, bottom up. Bottom up in, it, do, it doesn't come from some you know, government agency that's saying this is how it should be done. So you need to pilot, you need to develop processes, um, and then you need to give time for adaptation. You, know, you might not be able to stay all across the country, we're starting this all at once. But even computerization didn't happen like that. Mobile telephone didn't happen like that. Roads don't happen like that. So here too, it will be you know organic. And then you need to do the kind of things that uh, Amrish and Sipti are doing because there are problems with uh, records. There are missing records. All of those have to be for once fixed so that um, we can go on, right? And then finally, um, the policy framework. Uh, the big issue uh, with having so much of data with the government is, you know, the, the state is uh, essentially becoming the surveillance state, you know, across the world. And um, we have issues with um, how this data could be used. And some people will say, if you have all of this information available, anybody can, can hack and, you know, they come to know this property is owned by this person or that person or the government itself can go after, uh, you know, opponents and stuff. So what are the things we should have? Since the lady at the back has said I have about three minutes, I'm going to quickly mention um, easily, I think, we need to have five things. The first is consent for use of the data. And two, right to explanation. I think this is going to be increasingly important, and this presentation could be a template for adopting any new technology later on, which involves big data. because. The government can run a lots of you know lots of analysis. It can also use artificial intelligence to arrive at you know decisions. For example, today you apply for something, you say, "Hey, you know this is my property. I want a license to use it for commercial purposes." And the government says, "Oh, this computer says you can't do that. Why? I have no explanation because the computer says this. It's something we all come across when we go to the immigration, right?" So we need to have a right to explanation, meaning if you create an algorithm, there has to be some kind of documentation and you should be able to explain it if somebody thinks you know, he has been wrongly uh, you know, dealt with. And then the third is data limitation, meaning we only provide, we're only asked to provide as much data as is required, not everything, right? 
all those people who, who, who are in the business of um, designing survey questionnaires would agree to this. We want to like, you know, add everything. You know, can you ask about your grandfather? Yes. But is it important? Is it necessary? You have to have a limitation on data. You have to have a limitation on purpose. Every country needs to have this in the law that the data cannot be used for anything other than for the purpose for which it was collected. Otherwise, there could be profiling, there could be discrimination. <coughs> and then finally, storage limitation. All of this takes, you know, storage. And, you know, it's, it, most countries don't even have the technological capacity to store a lot of information, you know, that they would like to store. So if we take care of these, I think, you know, we would be in a position where uh, we are able to exploit this wonderful technology that offers security, that offers convenience and efficiency for one of the oldest and most pressing governance issues across the world, which is, you know, how do you ensure property rights are secure? I look forward to your questions. Thank you. While they rearrange the stage, as we have seen, uh, all of you may have had the slips, and I'd really request you to write it down, because yesterday, as we saw from Dr. Khatib Basri's uh, uh, session, if you write down the questions, we might stay more focused and therefore have more questions to answer rather than have a free uh, discussions uh, from the beginning. So I'd really appreciate and invite you to write down the questions on the slips of paper that's been circulated so that we can then pick up some of them and try to respond. We will set it in a blockchain. Yes, we could do it in a blockchain if you have the resources, please, you have a contract. Yeah, actually while they're doing it, one thought that came to my mind, particularly because I'm really fascinated by technology in a sense because that's been my whole education. On the other hand, I'm extremely cagey about proposing technology as a solution, or as the solution. And what's interesting is what Bala said, that Sweden is one country where blockchain has been used for land records. Do you think it's a coincidence? Just think about it. Sweden probably has every inch of its land already mapped and recorded. It could be transferred very easily. I'm sure much of Western Europe, Germany or US has much of their land records available in a very transparent and open system. In US, I know people can download maps from the internet with as accurate, much accuracy as anyone can think of. So once you have that base platform, technology can be of great use. The challenge is how do we get there? And that's where Ambrish and their experience was so useful. So now Bala and Ambrish, please. So while you are, I hope you are writing the question because I don't have the, my phone with me so I can't follow the app. Apo apologies to the organizers and I'm technologically challenged. So if you have written the it's question, in spite, of your education. in spite of my education, which actually shows the limitations of technology. Uh, so if you have written the question, there are people who can collect it. Uh, there's one there. Or you want to start off just to warm up and get started. So you are welcome. Raise your hand so that I can see. And we'll invite. You already have one. Ah, OK. Benu here. The mic. You have the mic? No, no problem. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation on the boxing technology. I know that in uh, um, Karnataka, they did a very good work on that, you know, digitization of land reports. That is called Bhumi Mod. Bhumi means land. Bhumi is an Hindi word um, in India. Sanskrit is also Bhumi. So that is the land I mean, here. They did a wonderful I mean, work on digitization of land record. And it has been updated also, I mean, as of date, like whatever the transactions has taken place. And it has uh, been also connected to that uh, you know, banking system. So what you guys are arguing for that your property rights of the people, but unless the development rights are also looked into it, I don't find that simply blockchain technology or 
I mean, digitization of land records, I mean, yeah, this has got certain advantages. But what I wanted to see that they will have access to. Suppose I am, I was talking, I mean, just right now with uh, Arvin, because we are more concerned with the bottom of the pyramid population. They should have access to market. They should have access to credit. They should have access to technology. So that the benefits of liberalizations, they should, I mean, be the largest constituency, not the big people who can just, I mean, go to, I mean, hang around Washington, Hong Kong, or China, Beijing. Yeah, that is not the issue. The issue is that how these people can benefit. So when I just, I mean, because I was working for the National Bank, I know all over the country what is happening. Uh, after digitization of land records and all that, Andhra Pradesh has not been able to get much access to finance and credit because I have seen it in my own year also. Uh, in Karnataka, digitization of land records, I thought that there will be escalation of uh, short-term credit and investment credit, but that has also not, I mean, I mean taken place substantially. Now, there can be problem for the, I mean, financial side, but what I, I mean, uh, feel that why uh, that land as a collateral, I mean, it has not, I mean, made much of a headway. So don't you think that, I mean, simply digitizations will not do, simple blockchain should not be do, but some of the things which uh, Amrish was, I mean, trying to do that, uh, there should be a proper hint interface with the human beings also so that they can bring those people for accessing credit technology and market. What are your take on for this? Sir? Thank you very much. Uh, I think there is no doubt uh, ultimately that uh, the technology is for human beings. I mentioned it in the presentation and I also put it on the slide that during the transition we are going to need to ensure that wherever there are no records, records are made, and wherever there are discrepancies in records, those discrepancies are connected. And I mentioned that the kind of work that the and uh, are doing is key to that. Uh, and two is, uh, I, I beg to differ with you on some of the facts you mentioned. Karnataka started in 2006, but very poorly implemented it, because what Karnataka did was essentially made all the hard copies into soft copies. That is not exactly right. That's where, you know, uh, the, the step that Amrish is doing is missing, right? So if there was a discrepancy in the hard copy, it went into the soft copy. That doesn't make any you know, any difference. And, and Andhra Pradesh, you know, is, is the last 10, 15 years has been going through a lot of things, right? Uh, so it was not in a position to capitalize, otherwise they could have. The good thing about Andhra Pradesh digitization of land records is they were the first to say, hey, we've got 45 lakh, that is, you know, for other seniors, uh, 4.5 million uh, land records that they have seen, which have discrepancy, right? And just two, three months ago, uh, the Andhra government has announced that at village level, they're going to try and, uh, you know, fix this by talking to, you know, people. Uh, I do not know where, in which part of the presentation I can came across as uh, advocating for technology supplanting human beings. No, not at all. And as I said, it's organic. It has to be. My point is this. When there is a technology that is a big enabler, how long will you be able to stay away from it? It's the same arguments we give for computerization of bank. He said the people who need the financial inclusion don't know how to use the ATM. But look what's happening. And finally, this does not cost anything to the consumer. In fact, it would reduce the cost. Because when a farmer wants to capitalize on, uh, on the land, he's paying huge charges for the banks and the insurance companies for just taking this service. Right? So I think we are on the same page when it comes to the objectives. I'm just saying that this is the future. <coughs> Amrish, do you have anything to say on that? Uh, not much, but this issue is... Particularly the credit uh, access that he said, yeah. Uh, credit access and other things. Just by even getting titles is also not... Because after getting titles also, getting access to credit, these are the issues on which we are working right now. And we know how difficult it is. Despite getting titles, to get access to credit through banks and normal institutional financing, those issues are there. That is all. Biggest challenge in India in modernization of land records in India, which I face is, uh, which I feel is that our land records do not reflect ground level reality for large areas. 
and especially areas that are owned by governments. On paper, this land and properties belong to government, but in actual practice, it is being used for years and generations by people for education, for cultivation, for work. so many things. These things do not just reflect in the land records at all. At all. And start just digitizing and modernizing these land records is not going to be enough. You must first give, you must first recognize, my main point is that you must first recognize that the people who are living on this land, who are cultivating this land, have a right over this land. Right now we are treating them as illegal encroachers. Criminals who need to be removed from this land. And big campaigns, despite Forest Rights Act, despite Forkers Act, despite so many things, in situ rehabilitation for slum dwellers and etc. People are being removed. Main, main question is people are being bulldozed. Old settlements, 100 years old settlements in Baroda itself, you see. 100 years old settlements of people living there, they have been bulldozed in the last four years without any proper rehabilitation. And people have lost, they have lost all their rights. And these lands are being sold to uh, these owners and other developers. Mafia. Mafia. And mafia. That is what is happening. And then, so the biggest question is whether the government's or political <laughs> will to recognize <laughs> that land, it is not the owner. That's a paradigm question is whether the state is the owner of all land or whether people who are cultivating using those lands and have been done that peacefully over the years, they are the real owners of this land. This issue needs to be addressed head on before we can talk. Otherwise, these people will be left out and they will be removed from them. Actually, that relates to a question that's come to me here. Um, examples from developing countries, and you have been hearing the examples, but the question is, what kind of policy or legal framework that's necessary to make it happen? Make the transition possible? Uh, and the second question is also related to that, that uh, the use of technology in, in order to claim their land that taken by the government and this is where my question also would be like here, like Bala already uh, pointed out, that since a lot of this kind of particularly land related information are already in the hands of the government, then would the government be the agency that will adopt the technology and therefore perpetuate the misuse that some of us have fear for? Or is the technology accessible enough so that people uh, like Amrish and others who are working on the ground are in a position to adopt the technology. Because to me, it seems, think of, think of the mobile phone. It, it, the technology flew as the government opened up the mobile telephony to the public and private sector. There was no need to build awareness, education, bottom-up approaches because it went to the bottom. And this is where the two, the two presentations, in my view, show the distinction and I'd like to hear from them that one, where the technology, and I, I was witness to that, that the technology was adopted from the bottom and emerged. And the other, one could argue that the technology has emerged from the bottom as the blockchain, but it has emerged at a much higher skill level, that is techno-evangelists. People who are technologically much more advanced adopted the blockchain technology, they got the cryptocurrency, and the only agency, private sector and public sector, which has been first off the block adopting it, are the banks. And there's a reason for it, because they probably have the best quality information to be recorded on that for future. Whereas for land, in developing countries, we have a challenge. So the question is for both, as these two questions here say, that what's the initial condition that would make it conducive? What kind of laws, like in this case FRA, in blockchain, what kind of privacy and protection can, you know, so that, that frames the challenge. Uh, you want yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start uh, with busting some things, right? Adopting blockchain will not give new powers to the state that it doesn't already have. It already has all the property, right? So the first thing we might want to do in terms of law uh, is come up with uh, a legislation for conclusive titles. Across the world, in most countries, almost all the countries, the titles are presumptive. The state owns all the land. 
you are in possession of the land. So what would be interesting is whether we can come up with a conclusive title, one. And two is, well, the blockchain is, you know, part of that and whether, you know, you know, banks adopted it because they are technology driven. I beg to differ. Why banks adopted it is because they are constantly looking at profits, right? What blockchain does to the bank is it reduces the scope for fudging manipulation. So the cost of controlling quality reduces, efficiency improves. Therefore, they have done it. Now, to the consumers themselves, it translates into less cost in the long run. What the state allows to do is that they adopt this as a technology for holding the records. That's all. It doesn't give new powers. In fact, the states are already happy. You go to the computer and then you see whether your records are there or not. All I'm saying is the way they are maintaining it right now, it can be misused. We want a more secure and more efficient and more transparent technology. It doesn't give new, new powers to the state. That's it, you know. Um, finally, as I just said, that I mentioned the kind of laws that we, we would need uh, to, to put in place. And data protection is, you know, one well, of them. Yeah, Amrish? Because uh, from having seen the Archer's experience, I think what, what we lose sight often, because we have already moved through it, is the three, four, five years that Arch and many others in India struggled at the social level to get the policy framework first. That if the law with all its limitations and compromises came up, and therefore now there is a handle to move forward. And therefore the legal framework I think is very critical. And that is where I think the banks well, look at, are able, if they are at all able to uh, capitalize and make greater profit by using blockchain, I think it will happen because they already have a much higher quality or better quality of information than land records. Therefore, the banks are already much ahead because financial transactions are not just banks. Financial transactions are probably the most secure in terms of quality and therefore can be adopted to the technology as a first step, and which is what we are seeing across the world. But I have another question for, for Bala, particularly, and the distinction between the two, that a techno-evangelist can adopt blockchain. Those who have quality of information, better quality of information, can adopt blockchain. But when the information is lacking, as this session is primarily focusing on land, and there's a huge discrepancy between land records in poor countries versus land records in rich countries, how would this transition happen without the kind of grassroots involvement that Amrish and others are trying to do, that is get the information from the ground to have it, have the record as it's reflected on the ground before the, before the framework for the technology comes in? Well, I, I don't think at any point of time I said we no. can discuss no, no, it's what, a, yeah, yeah. right? In fact, I mentioned very clearly that's going to be the first step. What I'm saying in simple terms is now for close to 95,000 farmers, 150 have helped secure titles. I'm saying, can Ambush and Zripti promise them that 30 years from now, those records will not be fudged? That they will be secure? I'm saying we need to have a mechanism where they don't have to, or people like Amrishan, they don't have to repeat the exercise, right? That's said, the banks don't have all the information, right? For a country like India, or most of the you know, countries, most lands are not associated with banks because we have, we have not capitalized on them. And therefore, property information as, as, as of now is one, not 100% accurate. Number two, not 100% complete. So that step has to be there. We need to do that. And then this happens. And, 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 and those who are going to use the technology, I mean, imagine, in my dream world, it would be several blockchain natures floating around, you know, because that would be an art. We, whether we like it or not, the state controls property rights. And therefore, we are saying that since you are going to anyways, you know, 
have a snooze for the, the snooze around my head and neck, can I at least say that please have one where you wouldn't accidentally press a button and I will die? Right? So another question. Okay. Let me, let me uh, okay. On this. Because it's true. In, in a way, state is controlling these things and uh, so it is better. And what, what should not forget that this digitization, whatever limited digitization of land records has happened, that has given huge benefits to the yeah. You imagine the time people spend getting just uh, Satbara records and now the, 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 the ease of things. You know, I can sit, sit in, sitting in my room, I can access any land record of any village of Gujarat just by sitting in my room. So that, that advantage is there. And by adopting the technology also would ease, ease some of the things which need to be done. It, it can help because most of most of our land records are do not reflect the reality. And in that technology can help. Again, if you you, you adopt this GIS technology and geospatial technology on a much larger scale to map who is owning which land. Uh, who, is, who is in possession of which land, it makes it much more easier. We just, which we could just give them simple GPS devices and uh, these things can multiply on it. Main challenge is, main challenge is whether we have a political will to do this or not. That is, that is the biggest challenge. And despite, with all the talks of going for blockchain and all this technology, whether the state wants to really do give it. property ah. rights to the people <laughs> who matter yes. is there or not, that is the biggest question. And for that, it won't just come from legal frameworks or, or technology. Legal frameworks, it's a political fight yeah. which uh, people have to fight. Yeah, it's a political fight, but there's a very interesting question. I had read about it, but since Bala is here, I'd like to ask him because uh, uh, it says that the estimated cost of Bitcoin technology or blockchain technology and Bitcoin as the most successful example of adoption of blockchain, the energy cost, that is the cost of running all these computers across the world is huge. And this person has said that uh, according to estimates, whole of American, all of American cities could be run for a week. That's the level of energy that the blockchain technology is, or the Bitcoin technology is consuming. So what's the impact of such large energy consumption? And is that a constraint for a wider adoption of blockchain? I actually tried to preempt this question in my presentation. I said, there are two different things. Why Bitcoin takes so much of energy and hardware power is because it is a trade that's happening across the world, you know, simultaneously for every coin, right? We don't have to do that for blockchain. So in the I mean, for land blockchain, record, you mean? Uh, for uh, blockchain, uh, land, land records, record, right? Yeah. So uh, for land records, uh, if I have a property and that particular ledger is going to be accessed at the match at any point of time by like four people, five people, not more than that. Otherwise, it's just it's it's just lying in your you know hard disk. It doesn't require that kind of. So, um, whoever gave this question, I would say, hey, go to uh, 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 the uh, promo website and look at how much more energy uh, has been consumed by the experiment in Sweden, because that would be the correct, uh, you know, uh, thing data point to look at, not how a, a different application that has huge, you know, uh, uh, say, uh, number of people constantly um, uh, deploying simultaneously shouldn't be the one to look at. Also, this cost would go down as over time. Yeah, and more people come in. Yeah, as more, that, that's true, like it has happened for the mobile, uh, mobile technology. Uh, I don't know about the time, but I had a question since I don't have any other on my hand. Uh, particularly, some of us might be interested, and Bala already mentioned that he wants to avoid the question about the Bitcoin price collapse of the last one month. And uh, I have been a particular beneficiary because one very good friend of mine just this week uh, donated a, a laptop to me and he said that it came from the profits he made on Bitcoin. So <laughs> I have a vested interest in understanding this, that apart from the price fluctuation, there have been some very well documented and enormous frauds on the cryptocurrency, Japan being one very big example, uh, 
technologically advanced country that faced a huge challenge, multi-million dollar, in fact, I think $250 million worth of fraud despite the blockchain. So what, what's your take on that? Because I don't understand the technology much, so I'm asking Bala. Fair. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't call it a fraud because what happened essentially was theft. Fraud would be people who are involved uh, in it, you know, manipulating solvers. This was essentially a theft. It's like you, you, you have something open and then, uh, sorry, close and somebody goes, breaks the door and takes it, right? Um, however much blockchain is secure, I don't think we can ever say that any technology, or for that matter, anything in the world is 100% secure. But what's interesting is, compare this with the amount of counterfeit currency and double spending that happens in the fake currency. And tell me how that compares, right? The good thing about blockchain is something happened, the whole world came to know, hey, this happened. This cannot be you know, suppressed. This fact cannot be suppressed. And you come up with a new secure measure. And we know that this is not going to happen. That is not going to happen in, 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 in other currencies. So this is a theft. There are thieves. That will happen. We will come up with better laws. Uh, are there any other? Is there no other question? Because I think we are we are finished uh, much of our time. Do you have a question? Depends. Uh, Anirudh, yeah. What are the political hurdles that you can foresee with the implementation of a national level uh, land record project on a blockchain? Okay. It's a very I give you an example. In one Southeast Asian country, there was an international corporation key, who, which came in trying to map the entire country by sending cars all over the place. All over the place. Sending Take what? Cars, cars. Cars all over the place, Google. taking pictures, oh, okay. and uh, the uh, the political elite did not appreciate that and asked Google to shut down the project because. Uh, when Google takes pictures, uh, all those pictures are getting published online and they're creating records, permanent records. So do you see, see some uh, similar political hurdles in India where, poli uh, where land rights are not secure in the first place and there are a lot of disputes going on in many parts of India. Do you think there could be significant um, opposition to this, this kind of project? A lot of opposition actually. One is because across the world politicians are involved, you know, in some kind of land right? <laughs> so, um, for our own uh, conference on using blockchain for property, um, we had a lot of, you know, very high government officials on our panels. We were able to convince people to come. But one of the things that I heard in the ministry was that this all sounds fine, but all our senior officials are from UPN, right? So what they, they meant was that all of them have lots and lots of binami properties, right? So they are not going to be, you know, very convinced because one of the things that would happen with this kind of transparent mechanism is binami properties would become. You want to explain binami because that's the way. Oh yeah. So essentially, binami is you know you buy property in somebody else's name. So you're parking your wealth in the name of somebody else. So you don't have to. Including your dog, you could buy a piece of property in your dog's name. Well, in, in our country, one of the gods is uh, property. You know, a legitimate legal persona. There is a case being fought in the name of the god, right? I can at least see the you know dog. <laughs> not the God, right? So that's that's quite possible. So the problem with this and why uh, you know politicians are not going to be so willing uh, is because they are involved in property generally. And two, um, if you see the two states that are forging ahead, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, are new states, right? And they have a lot of scope now to set records straight. And I am assuming that if you are in power today and in those states, you have a lot of leverage to change states. And you might want to keep some things to your advantage and go ahead with, you know, uh, a reform in, in other matters. That said, there are some interesting examples like in, you know, in Gujarat and Rajasthan where some movement towards, you know, uh, the land title, conclusive land title, you know, is happening. Uh, that's very, very encouraging. I think at some point of time, you know, 
you just have to, if you're a politician, find other sources of income and you know let people have the land. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just one point. Uh, same thing. Not only with blockchain, just digital maps. They are not made for we have digital blind records, but to match red records with the maps and what is existing on the actual ground. Why don't you make these digital maps public? Because maps, village maps are public, public document, anybody can apply and get it. There is no legal holder in doing it. But nobody is doing it because most of the maps are wrong. We do not have a real village boundaries, but not individual survey number boundaries. We do not have accurate village boundaries anywhere in the country. Most of these are village boundaries with gone and your digital maps, they, they, don't, they don't reflect the reality. So matching these maps, so just make these digital maps public. Anybody put, put them on Google, so you can find out that who owns and what is the actual situation, what it shows on records. So much of cross-checking can happen, right from the bottom, down, bottom, bottom of approach. Strong resistance is doing that. Nobody is willing to give you digital. Let logs of your survey number is something very secure, security, nobody can get that. That is how we are living, that is where we are living. Actually, in Hanta Pradesh, <coughs> at village level, they are trying to, as, as I mentioned, you know, put the map on the panchayat, you know, local government uh, wall, uh, so that people are able to say, hey, this is not exactly the shape of my land, and, you know, internally they are able to talk. Uh, through and come to okay, this is going to be the new map, and forever we will, you know, the the cost of having uh, a, a map that is not consistent with reality is much higher than probably a few square feet you would have to give to your neighbor mm -hmm. to fix things, yes, okay. and people are willing to do that. People would be willing. Yeah, they are. People, people are, are willing. Are doing. They are just in this survey. They are just repeating the old maps. Which was surveyed land that was such a map prepared by British in 1930s. You are doing this re survey now, and you are just overlaying those maps and reproducing them as digital. They are not doing any further. Okay, I think this discussion, I'm sure, can, uh, will continue beyond this session and the lunch and afterwards. The point, the concluding this thing, or the only thing I can say is that while technology is not a panacea, technology can greatly complement a lot of the social, political, economic factors to take the next few steps that are necessary. Thank you very much for joining this session. Thank you, Bala and Amrish. And that's the end of this session. Thank you.